in our last session as we finish this. And what I've called is the soldier's danger. We have looked at the concept of a soldier, and we're all soldiers who belong in the Lord's army. We've looked at a soldier's duty, in other words, what they're meant to do. We've looked last week at a soldier's strength, where his courage and power comes from. And tonight, we're going to look what happens to a soldier when he becomes a shipwreck in his faith. And that's the idea of shipwreck. It's sort of something we don't associate with Christians, but we're going to tonight. And um, the first thing that I've looked at, I call it an informative commitment, because we find that Paul has been encouraging Timothy to keep on going, even though it's a tough task that he's been given in the church. And the verses that we're looking at are these which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck in regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I handed over to Satan to be taught to blaspheme. It's quite an interesting thought that is there. But we're going to look at the danger of a Christian soldier when he becomes shipwrecked in his faith. What does it look like? and why and does it happen? it happen? Now Paul's been encouraging Timothy to stay the course. He's been encouraging him to be committed to his calling as a part of the church at Ephesus. Even though this man facing some difficult obstacles, he had some big shoes that he had to fill. He followed the Apostle Paul who had begun the work there. And Timothy is being challenged to remain committed to the task that is before him as the pastor of the church. He's saying to me, don't give up because things get difficult. Keep on going. Keep on trusting. Hang on to your faith. Make sure that your lifestyle reflects your consistency with what you preach and what you believe. When we look at the commitment as Christians, the simplest way is the way that we respond to God and what he has to say because of what he's done. In other words, why do I do these things? It's because of the person I serve, and I do it because of what he's done or he's doing in my life. And if we're honest, we struggle with the thought of commitment to God. Because when it comes down to it, we don't want something that requires too much of us, that asks too much of us, that ask that us, us to, to sacrifice, sacrifice much. much. Yet, Yet, if it's if something that doesn't cost, cost us much, much well, there's not there's much, not much effort. effort. We know that deep down, down, we can't, we can't really, really call this commitment. It's not it's really, really commitment. commitment. We, understand we understand if there is no there's sacrifice, no then the reality, the reality is, is there's no there's commitment. No commitment. And in the and times in which we live, we're looking for something which makes us comfortable with a less of an emphasis on what it will cost us if we engage in something. In other words, we've got the same benefits of commitment, but we don't want to commit. But we want all those things that go with it. And as a result, we often become confused about what commitment really looks like. We want to live for the moment, and if we're not getting what we want, we look for ways to get ourselves out of things that we don't like. like. And we see see this this being played played out in our society society every day. People People looking looking to get out of their marriages marriages because they become too difficult or they're not getting what they feel they they should. should. The same thing is often happening happening in the workplaces workplaces, where we don't honor contracts contracts or feel feel that we can get better conditions conditions elsewhere. elsewhere. So So what it boils down to it becomes all about what we want and how we feel about these things. That's not commitment. Commitment is something that we see through to the end. It's not becoming half-hearted about something and then giving up because things become too difficult. And as Christians, we have the perfect example of this and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't give up because things got too difficult along the way. He went all the way. He committed himself to his task. 
And how we respond to commitment is an important test of who we are and what we are. How we respond to these difficulties shows us a lot about ourselves. And sometimes what it brings out are things that we don't like about ourselves. We really don't. Timothy was faced with a difficult task of having to deal with leaders who were in important positions of power and leadership in the church. And he was given the task to correct and discipline them in such a way that it honoured the Lord. Not easy to do. And he couldn't allow himself the luxury of delegating this responsibility to somebody else. Because it was Paul who was mentoring and challenging him. Look, 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 Timothy, finish what you start. Don't give up because it's too difficult. Keep on going. Now, we now see we the see consequence, consequence, which some have rejected and so on, some have shipwrecked in regard to the faith. The <coughs> now, last the week, we saw the soldier's strength, strength, and that was by right, right, hanging on to the faith, the faith that you have and having and a good conscience. conscience. In other in words, words, your, your life, life is, reflected is reflected in the Word of God being your authority. It tells you what's right and wrong. And a good conscience, in other words, having a lifestyle that's consistent with what you believe, with what the good book says. And so, here, there are those who have said, no, that's not for me. They haven't hung on to their faith, and they haven't got a good conscience. And so, as a result, they reject the truth, and they've suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. And Paul doesn't sugarcoat this for Timothy. He makes no bones about it. He says, Timothy, there are certain people in the church who have rejected their conscience. They haven't made their faith their own. They've failed to get a handle on it. And so as a result, they become shipwrecked in their faith. Now it's important for us to understand that here it's speaking about a people who know what the truth is. They know what the truth is, but they've chosen to reject it. And because they've chosen to reject it, they have drifted away from their faith and damaged themselves because of their disobedience. How did this happen? And how does it start happening? Well, it starts by believing in the wrong things. It starts, instead of standing on the truth that they knew, and let's face it, they knew what was right. They know that they should do, but now they are incapable or unable to do it, even if they wanted to. So they've reached a point in their Christian life where they can't do the truth if they want to. They've allowed themselves to drift so far away that they still can't see that what they've done is wrong. So they're drifting. They might they have might experienced some difficult things, things in their life, life. Things, things that they were, that they were unprepared, unprepared for, and they become, and they become bitter, bitter because, because they believe they this should this not have happened to them. them. When, when they, they were, were doing all, all the right things, things. As, far as far as they were concerned, concerned it, wasn't it wasn't fair. fair. And neither and was neither God if he allowed these things to happen to those who he's supposed to love and care for. Familiar story? I wonder, I wonder how many, how many testimonies, testimonies in churches, churches that we have of people who turn their back on the Lord because, because they pray they were doing all the right things, things and something, something happened. happened. And, and it was, it was not what they expected. expected. It, was not, it was, was not something they asked for. for. And so they so believed they believe that God wasn't God fair in what he did. And so they turned their back on the Lord. They rejected his truth. They rejected who he is and they began to drift. They began to embrace the wrong things and as such, they drifted further away. Now Paul makes it clear that the two men mentioned in our text suffered shipwreck because they put away their faith. They pushed it away, meaning this was something that was deliberate. deliberate. It was something that was intentional on their part. They, they chose, chose to turn, turn from truth, truth to, to error. error. It, wasn't it wasn't just 
an on-the-moment thing. They made a decision. Now, I want to make this observation here. This is not something that happens on the spur of the moment. This is not something that you plan to do just on the spur of the moment. It's not like waking up one morning and deciding, look, I don't want this anymore. I don't want to be a Christian. I'm going to stop doing it. So I refuse to be a Christian anymore. What it's saying, instead of it being a moment, it's a process that happens over a period of time. It begins when a person allows sin to develop in their life, to remain here. And what happens is the sin bubbles away and begins to influence their lives. And they begin to move away from the things of God. And they get to the point where they're no they're longer no interested in what he has to say, to say. They, no they no longer care, care what he wants, what he wants them, to them to do. And this, and this can be can seen many times in scripture. It can be seen many times in our churches. churches. Now, now, I'm going to put some, some of these up here now. now. You might remember, remember the faces. The faces. Any look Any familiar? familiar? I'm sure they are. But there are many examples of people who have fallen, as they say, away from their faith over the years. And I'm going to mention a name. Let's see how many you remember. Charles Templeton. Anybody remember him? Well, he was an evangelist, a well-known American evangelist at the time of Billy Graham. He won many thousands of people to Christ. Yet, Yet he, struggled he struggled in what he believed. What he believed. And it came, it came to the point, the point where, where that struggle was, could he, could he believe the Bible, the Bible and trust it over science? science. And you know and the you choice, know choice that he made? made? He, decided he decided that the Bible, the Bible was in error. error. And, science and science had proved the Bible, the Bible to be wrong. wrong. And so, and so he walked he away from his faith. faith. And he wrote he a wrote book that some might have read, Farewell to God. That was Charles Chapman. Other Others example of mine, mine, how many remember Jimmy, Jimmy Swagger? Swagger. Okay. okay. How many, how many remember, remember Jim and Tammy, Tammy Baker? Baker? Yeah. yeah. What do you, what remember, you remember about that? About? Well, well they didn't they exactly didn't have, a have a good, good hold of their faith, faith and a lifestyle, and a lifestyle of conscience and reflected on what the Bible, Bible talks about. about. And they and fell they in their ministries. ministries. They, did they did the wrong things. things. They walked they away because of immorality, even, even though, though we still, we have, still have Jimmy Swagger back, back with a religious program building another empire himself. But he was exposed. He was kicked out because of his immorality. There's another, There's another fellow, fellow David, David Gass. Gass. I don't know how many remember who he is, is. but he's a, he's senior, a senior pastor, pastor who, who recently led Grace, Grace Family, Family Fellowship, Fellowship in a place called Pleasant, Pleasant Hill, Hill, Missouri. Missouri. And, he and he renounced his Christian faith as a system rife with abuse that caused him, quote, quite mental quite and emotional breaks. He says, after 40, 40 years of being a devout follower, 20 of those being an evangelistic pastor, I'm walking away from the faith. Even though this has been a massive bomb drop in my life, it has been decades in the making. He began in the thread before moving on to compare scripture to Greek mythology. I have fully devoted to study the scriptures. I think I missed maybe 12 Sundays in 40 years. I'd completely, I'd completely memorized 18, 18 books, books of the Bible. Of the Bible. I, was I was reading through the Bible, Bible for the 24th, 24th time, time when I walked, I walked away, away, he wrote. wrote. None, of, None it, of it, however, however helped, helped, his helped, his helped his marriage. So here's so a guy that was, was, if you like, for intents and purposes, purposes on fire for the Lord. Lord. A wonderful a example. example. And he said, but now it's mess. It didn't save my marriage. But there's always something deeper when you look for it. 
A member of his congregation had this to say in response to those things above. He said, yes, he was my pastor, and he walked away. The problem was, he had just slept with a married woman in the church and got caught. He never repented, they still lived together, he wrote in the newspaper. Last year, all that information came to light. The affair happened to almost a year before it was uncovered. So the whole I did everything right in my marriage part was kind of funny until I saw how many people liked this story. Hill song, uh, songwriter Marty Sampson wrote, Time for some real talk. I'm genuinely losing my faith. Christians can be the most judgmental people on the planet. They can also be some of the most beautiful and loving people, but it's not for me. I'm not in anymore. Now he's well known in contemporary Christian music as a songwriter and leader in Hillsong. He's walking away from his faith. Now some of you might remember a fellow called Joshua Harris. Joshua Harris wrote a book by Kiss Dating Goodbye. But he's the former pastor of a mega church in Maryland. He renounced his faith, saying, I have only got a massive shift regarding my faith in Jesus. The popular phrase for this is deconstruction. The biblical phrase is falling away. By all the measurements I have for defining a Christian, I am no longer a Christian. According to what the Bible says, I'm no longer a Christian. The latest tri profile Christian personality to renounce his faith is a fellow called Paul Maxwell, a well-known desiring God writer. Maxwell said on his Instagram feed, what I really miss is connection with people. What I've discovered is that I'm ready to connect again, and I'm kind of ready not to be angry anymore. I love you guys, and I love all the friendships and support I've built here. And I think it's important to say that I'm not just a Christian anymore. These are just a few examples of well-known people who have shipwrecked their faith by falling or by failing to keep a good conscience. When you choose not to do something that you know is right, then you introduce confusion and doubt into your life. You begin, you begin, if you like, what I call, what I call you begin, begin to disappear, disappear down, down certain rabbit trails, rabbit trails which, begin which begin to influence and impact your faith to the point you no longer you know, see or believe the things you once did. did. And that's what's that's happening, what's happening today. today. People, people are believing believe science. science. People are believing people a lot of the higher criticisms. They will not take the Bible to be literal or an authority anymore. And so because they believe that the Bible is nothing more than myths, they turn away from their faith. And the Greek word here for shipwreck, it has the idea of to break a ship up, to remove the rudder, to drift aimlessly through many dangerous currents of life with no way to steer clear of danger. In other words, when you've got a ship that's rudderless, it's at the mercy of the elements. It's at the mercy of the sea in which it floats from this place to another. And that's what it's describing here of Christians who have turned their back on God. They're floating, just floating along. They're at the mercy of whatever currents that they're in. And they can't do anything else to stop drifting. Now, I want to make this very clear. This verse is not teaching that you as a Christian will lose your salvation. It's not even talking about salvation because you yourself do not make yourself a Christian. Only God can do that and only God can place you in his family and only God can take you out. You cannot decide, oh, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore. That's not up to you to decide. If you genuinely I put your put faith your and trust, trust in Jesus Christ. Christ. You belong you to him for all eternity. Now you can you drift can away, away, you can turn your back on him, but you but still belong to him. him. You, you don't, don't suddenly just decide, decide I don't belong, I don't belong to God, God anymore. anymore. You don't you serve don't him serve anymore. anymore. 
And in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 27, Paul, when he's talking about his service for Jesus Christ, he says, I don't want anything to be hindered by an inconsistent walk and a word that would disqualify him from receiving, receiving his reward and making him be a castaway. He says this, you know that in the race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. So run to win. All those who compete in the games use self-control so they can win a crown. That crown is an earthly thing that lasts only a short time, but our crown will never be destroyed. So why do not run without a goal? I fight like a boxer who's hitting something, not just the air. I treat my body hard and make it my slave so that I myself will not be disqualified, in other words, become a castaway after I preach to others. He realises and understands that as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he has an important position. He's in the privileged position of teaching others the word of God. He doesn't want to be a hindrance to them or turn them away from their faith by word or by action. He wants them to have the best example that they can have. But he's aware that he can reach a point in his life where he's serving the Lord and he would be made a castaway. Now being made a castaway is simply this. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you rebel against him, if you turn your back on him, he will take you out of service and put you on the shelf and put a label, if you like, not fit for service. You still belong to him, but he cannot use you for his glory anymore. And Paul's danger was, I don't want to be that vessel, that instrument that's been taken and put on the shelf that God can't use anymore. And that's the danger that he was well aware of. And that's the danger that as Christians we should be aware of as well. He wouldn't lose his salvation. He belonged to the Lord. He always would. But he would no longer be an instrument the Lord could use. So he didn't want to be a stumbling block. And I believe that's the danger that we can become shipwrecked so that we so drift in the waters of life, life without a purpose, purpose without a direction, because, because we have deliberately chosen to push away from God, God, to push away from our faith, and fail to live it out. We still remain as Lord's property, 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 but he cannot use us in service. For the Christian, this is a real and present danger. If we're not disciplined, Paul says, I fight against him, I discipline myself so that this does not happen. Now he moves on and says um, that the culprits, I don't know what happened there. The culprits. Among these are Hyminius and Alexander. Now who are they? What do we know about them? <laughs> well, here we're told, um, a little bit later as we look at this, Paul mentions these two men by name. He mentions that they've shipwrecked their faith, and Timothy, he's giving the commendation here. You'd be very cautious and wary about these men and their intentions in the church. Don't get sucked in by their slick presentations. Don't get caught in by their interesting speculations. But do be alert and be on guard because they're designed to draw you away from the things that are true. Now, what we do know, and it's not much about these two men, but what we have is mentioned in the letters of Timothy. And up here in these verses you have, continue teaching these things, warning people in God's presence not to argue about words. It does not help anyone and it ruins those who listen. Make every Make effort to give yourself to God as the kind of person he will approve. Be a worker who is not ashamed and who uses the true teaching in the right way. Stay away from foolish useless talk because that will lead people further away from God. The evil teaching will spread like a sickness inside the body. 
Arminius and Letus are like that. They have they left have the true teaching, teaching saying, saying that the, the rising from the dead has already taken place, place and so they're destroying the faith of some people. So, so it seems it that Hymenius had embraced some error regarding, regarding, regarding the resurrection, the resurrection and, incorporated and incorporated this into aspects of his own faith. faith. And so and what so he was what teaching, he was teaching about, these about these ideas about, about the resurrection, resurrection he, was he was teaching them with authority, them with authority to others, others who were believing in it and were drifting and away from their faith. And that can, and that can happen. happen. When people, when people don't, don't read their Bibles, Bibles when, when people, people just trust the person that's up in the pulpit, pulpit as, being, as being speaking, speaking the Word of God, God without looking at it and saying, well, is this what the Word of God actually says? Then you then can you be can caught, be up, caught up, up with speculations. You'd be, caught, you'd be up caught up with a lot of fancy, fancy words, words, and you can and start, start to believe them. them. The only the authority we have is the word of God, and things and must line up, up with, with that, that word. word. Regarding, Regarding Alexander, Alexander, I think I'll put this up. No. no. With Alexander, Alexander, in 2 Timothy 4, 14 40 to 15, it says, Alexander, the metal worker, did many harmful things against me. The Lord will punish him for what he did. You also should be careful and let us not hurt you, because he fought strongly against our teaching. So what it seems is, Paul is saying to Timothy, don't get mixed up with this man. He'll use you and abuse you if you allow him to take advantage of you. We're not exactly, not exactly told exactly, exactly what he did, but it seemed to be significant. Be significant. Paul's take was he knows the, the truth, truth, but he opposes it when he gets the opportunity. He is a person who shipwrecked his faith, faith rejected the things that were right and true. true. It's, it's reminded to us that none of us, us are immune from the possibility, from the possibility of failing in some sense. sense. And if we fail in that sin, it can be the point where we can be shipwrecked in our faith. And it can happen to anyone. As 1 Corinthians 10, 12, 13 says, If you think you're strong, you should be careful not to fall. The only temptation that's come to you is that which everyone has. But you can trust God and will not permit you to be tempted more than you can stand. But when you are tempted, you will also give you a way to escape so that you will be able to stand. And lastly, we have an interesting statement. The condemnation, whom I handed over to Satan to be taught to blaspheme. Well, not blaspheme. Okay. I'm glad you're up on it. I've missed a word. To not, not blaspheme. Blast all, right? all right? Paul makes, Paul an, makes amazing an amazing but startling start statement, statement here. here. I've handed I've these people over to Satan. Why? Why, Why would you Why hand you somebody, somebody over to Satan? Satan? Why would Why you, you hand two people, people who profess to be Christians, Christians over to Satan? Satan? What's the What's point? The what would you do for we're told we're in the told text to learn not to blaspheme. Who? Who? To learn to, to not learn blaspheme, blaspheme God. God. The word the for word handed, handed over, over or delivered, or delivered is paravithomy, and it means and to it hand, hand over, over, to give over, give to over, abandon. To abandon. To. Now, as Christians, now, Christians we, have we have what I call the umbrella. umbrella. And that umbrella, and that umbrella there, there is in Scripture. We're all we're under all the banner of Christ. Christ. There's the there's husband, the husband there's, the there's the wife, and they're the children. And that's, and the, children. Children. And that's, and that's the biblical, biblical order, order that's set out in Scripture. Out the scripture. When, we when we apply those, those principles, principles when, when husband, husband, wife, and children, wife, and children are, are under, under the, submitting, submitting themselves, themselves under God, God. when the husband's the husband submitting, submitting to Christ, Christ he'll protect his family, lead the family, provide for the family. The wife will submit herself to her husband's leadership and provide comfort, and teach, and teach, nurture, and the children, and the children will love, love their parents and obey their parents. Their parents. They're, They're all, all under the umbrella, umbrella of, God's of God's protection. protection. Now, when you, now go, when out you go out in the store, store you, want you want some sort of protection, protection against, against the, the elements. elements. And for the Christians, for the Christian, we have we that have protection. protection. The families, the families have, have that protection. protection. Now, now, 
this idea of handing somebody over to Satan, it's the idea of hands off to remove any protection. It means to allow Satan to have his way with that person. And this is serious stuff that it's talking about, not to be taken lightly. And it means exposing that person to great danger. That person no longer has all that protection. They've been completely given over to Satan. Now, it's important to know that for someone to be delivered over to Satan means they are put out of the protection of the believing community and they are given over fully to Satan. In other words, God is withdrawing all his hand of protection which they have up to this point in time enjoyed. And Paul is not acting on the spur of the moment. He's not he's doing not it in the heat of the moment, moment because he's angry with these men, men and what they're doing. He's doing, he's doing because he's concerned about, about their growth, growth and development as Christians. Christians. And, this and this is, is more a remedial process, process where, he's where he's praying that they will come to their senses, that they'll, that they'll understand, understand the error of their ways and be fully and restored in their faith and walk with Jesus Christ. Now, when a believer continues to walk in their in sin in the church, church what, what responsibility, responsibility does the church, does the church have, have to do to deal, to deal with, with that believer? What should, what should they do? Is there any, Is there any scriptural? scriptural? What should they what should do? Point me to the scriptures. What if I gave you Matthew 18? Matthew 18 says, says, if your fellow believer sins against you, what should you do? Go to him in private, tell him what he did wrong. If he listens to you, you've helped that person to be your brother or sister again. But if you refuse to listen, go to him again and take one or two other people with you as witnesses. Every case may be proved by two or three witnesses. <laughs> if that person refuses to listen to the church or listen to uh, them, then tell then the tell church. church. If he refuses, refuses to listen to the church, to church then know what it says. Then, then treat him, him like a person who does not does believe in God, God or, like or like a tax collector. Tax collector. Wow. wow. Pretty strong. Pretty strong. Now what now Paul is saying is if the appropriate steps are taken and that, that believer refuses, refuses to comply, to comply then, then he's to be treated as a tax collector or publican. Meaning, meaning, let him, let go, him back go back and embrace, and embrace the, world, the world if that's if what that's he wants. What he wants. This, will this will give them time, time to sort out their lives, lives and their priorities. priorities. The way, the way they, they were living doesn't, doesn't match what they were saying. The they have the they truth, have truth, but are not doing, doing anything, anything with that with truth. truth. They are hypocrites. Their actions are destroying the testimony and image of God when others look at their lives. They are inconsistent. They make the Christianity a mockery. And so doing this, they blaspheme God by their words and actions. Paul says, I turn them over to Satan to sift them. He'll destroy them and take away what they do have. But in the process, they will learn to love the one who loves them, who can heal them, who can forgive them, restore them if they so choose. This is the whole point of the action. It's to restore believers who have fallen away and embraced error instead of truth. This is what these two men were delivered over to Satan for judgment. Now, when you think about it, is this an easy task for Timothy to do? He's a young man. These men are in positions of influence and power in the church. And he has, he has to, to come, come and discipline, and discipline them and allow Satan, and allow and Satan, Satan to sit there. Now these, now these men, men have fallen, fallen away. away. They have they put have away, put away their, faith. their faith. In other words, the actual Greek brings out apathy, apathy meaning to violently reject, reject, to discard aggressively. In other words, in other words they don't want anything to do with their faith anymore. They don't want a pure conscience. conscience. They don't want to live for holiness. They don't want to live for purity. They want to live for their own lust, success, and gratification. And as a result, when they throw away a good conscience, they shipwreck the faith. It's like throwing away the rudder, and you're at the mercy of the wind and the sea. 
Paul says, says, I've, I've handed, handed them, them over. over. For, these For these reasons, reasons they may they learn, learn that they might they be afflicted, afflicted, they might they be, might be punished, punished by Satan. By Satan. We, don't we don't know what they suffer, they suffer but they're in this position to learn. You cannot blaspheme, ridicule, or slander God. It's a lesson for us. Sin has consequences. Chastisement will be coming our way because of the Lord's love for us if we persist in our rebellion. And we can become castaways or suffer the possibility of being taken home early because God can no longer use us. We become disqualified from serving Him. I guess the question I'm leaving you with is, are we, are we as Christian soldiers, soldiers of the Lord's, Lord's army, army, are we in are danger, we danger of shipwrecking our faith? Are we in, are we in danger, danger of disqualifying, of disqualifying ourselves, ourselves from his service? His service. Does, Does our, our message, message match, match the, way the way that we, we walk, walk and talk in, in the world? The world? Are, they are they consistent? consistent? Can people look at our lives and say, yes, that person indeed really believes the Bible because they live it out every day? Or are they just pretenders? They're just like me. They haven't done anything with something. When we live like that, we make a mockery of what God's Word says that we should be. It's important. The way we live before others is important. And I pray that that will be a challenge for us to not only not talk to talk, talk, but walk to walk. As we close, we're going to stand as we sing. Uh,